Okay, hello YouTube. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Rey Lopez, beginning after e4, e5, knight of 3 knight c6, bishop b5 begins the Rey Lopez, and we're going to be taking a look at the Berlin variation, beginning with knight of 6, and more specifically than that, we're only going to be taking a look at the anti-Berlin uh, variation, uh, beginning with the move pawn to d3, and we're not going to be taking a look at the move pawn to d3 with the move bishop takes c6 included, the so-called like kind of delayed exchange variation. We're only going to be taking a look at pawn to d3, where white intends the traditional plan of playing pawn to c3 and pawn to d4 at some point down the road without exchanging his bishop on the c6 square. Uh, so if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So anyways, uh, as previously stated, the reason that people play uh, the anti-Berlin in the first place, the reason they play a move like d3 is because in the main lines with Castle's Kingside, it's kind of like trying to squeeze water out of a rock, and it's just really annoying. You have a very slight edge in those variations, but it's never really quite enough to uh, kind of declare victory. And actually, Kasparov didn't manage to do it in all the games that he played against Kramnik in their World Championship match. Uh, he had that position over and over again with the white pieces in the main line of the Berlin and just was not capable of breaking through and getting the full point. So this has led people to this. Let's play slow. Let's play d3 with the idea of c3 and d4 down the road. This has also led people, uh, believe it or not, to have a huge resurgence in playing things like the Italian game, where they play this exact same slow setup. You can imagine the same position with the bishop on c4 instead of the bishop on b5. They're very, very similar, if not almost identical. Uh, and the plans are very, very similar. White's just going to play c3 and d4. So this version of the Rey Lopez has kind of brought back um, some old versions of the Italian game, which is kind of nice to see an opening make a revival that's like 200 years old, you know, or more. Like, it's one of the oldest openings in chess. You know, it goes way, way back. Um, so anyways... What are some of the ideas here? Uh, well, black can play the move bishop to c5. This is almost what everybody plays. They just kind of develop a piece. And now, of course, here white has the option to play the delayed exchange variation beginning with the move bishop c6, or he can play the move that is basically the subject of this video, this move pawn to c3. So now black needs to make a decision if he's going to play fast in the middle or if he's going to play slow. So basically, is he going to play some slow plan like castle's king side and then play slowly in the center of the board with moves like d6 or rook e8 or etc.? Or is he going to try to play quickly in the middle of the board by trying to make some early thrust involving pawn to d5? So what's interesting is this early thrust with pawn to d5, black can even just do it right now. Like he doesn't have to castle to get his king out of the pin on the c6 square. So if black wants to, black can just play d5 right away. And this is actually considered one of the main lines. Uh, and you might be looking at it going, this looks crazy. Like, can we play knight takes e5? Well, not really. <laughs> um, knight takes e5, black can actually uh, almost force a draw. Uh, there, there's like a draw by perpetual here. One, one of the problems is, is white's king is still in the middle of the board, and white is severely underdeveloped. So normally you don't want to go like pawn grabbing and like you're basically attacking with two pieces and none of your pieces are out yet. And in double e pawn openings, that's very dangerous. But just to show you kind of what happened here, uh, there was actually a game that kind of played out, we'll call it the theory, that played out all the theory that ends to a draw. It was played between Korobov and um, Trevishenko uh, played in... Uh, uh, played in 2021 and uh, that game continued knight takes e5 and then black just castles because again the whole point here is black is super developed like what is going on here uh, we have bishop takes c6 uh, b takes c6 and now white played the absolute correct move here uh, which is pawn to d4 you have to strike at the middle and kind of protect your knight on the e5 square now you might be wondering why can't we just keep taking stuff you know this is the normal kind of uh you know, uh, beginner level thinking, you know, we've taken stuff, why not take more? Uh, so if you take stuff, you're actually just almost losing because you have zero development. So the point here would be something like queen e8 hitting the knight, so we're threatening to win the knight, the knight's going to have to retreat, so knight d4, and then we would simply take on the e4 square, and then after castles, bishop a6 is decisive advantage black according to the computer. Um, and you can kind of see why. At this point, we're starting to win material. This uh, d3 square is pinned. Uh, we're attacking it several times. Only one piece is out, the knight on d4, and we've connected our rooks with black. This is 
really, really good stuff. So black has basically got a decisive uh, sort of winning advantage there. So after bc6, the uh, the Korobov game continued with d4. Uh, we had uh, this move bishop to b6. It's also possible to play queen e8, uh, which is also supposed to be relatively equal. Uh, you know, queen e8 takes, bishop a6, uh, just basically preventing white from castling, and then d takes c6, and then bishop d6 is... According to the engine, it's equal. I don't understand. I, I don't fully understand the assessment, considering that I think white's just worse. Like, white has a bunch of extra puns, but his king is still in the middle of the board, and I don't see that king getting out of the center anytime soon. I think if we see this type of position in the majority of uh, games, especially on the lower levels, it's just going to end in a win for black. But according to the engine, anyway, this position is, is close to equal. So after d4, uh, e takes d4, uh, after d4, instead of queen e8, we have uh, this move bishop to b6. Uh, was played in the Korobov game, castles kingside, uh, knight takes e4, takes on c6, queen d6, knight back to e5, bishop a6, rook e1, and then a queen sacrifice that ends the game with a draw. So queen takes e5, d takes e5, knight takes f2, queen f3, otherwise we lose the queen, and then we have a force perpetual. Knight h3, king h1, knight f2, king g1, knight h3, king h1, etc., king g1. So at the very least, black has a force perpetual um, in this main line, uh, this Korobov game, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it could, if you try other things with white, or if black does other things, potentially it could be uh, worse than a force perpetual. Potentially it could just be advantage black. So anyways, that's very long explanation why we don't take on e5. Short explanation, we're not developed. So really, uh, kind of the, the go-to move here uh, is this move knight on b to d2. And this is what uh, most of the top players that play this position try. Uh, like we have this game, uh, Anand versus Aronian, uh, played back in 2018, uh, that continued uh, castles kingside, castles kingside, rook e8, uh, e takes d5, a6. And again, I know this seems like kind of a strange move, uh, uh, you know, this a6, why aren't we just, after ed5, like, why aren't we just taking back? Like, why aren't we playing knight takes d5? Again, if we take back right away, this position is actually really easy for white to get a major advantage. After knight takes, we're going to play rook e1, hitting the pawn on e5. Bishop g4 is kind of forced because you have to make this pin to kind of defend the pawn, but then we just start kicking the bishop. So h3, uh, bishop back to h5, and then the critical move is not g4, which would severely weaken our king side, but knight to e4 with the idea of bringing the knight back to g3. So here we would have something like, say, bishop to f8, because we were attacking that bishop on c5, and then we bring the knight back to g3. So we're getting that knight back to g3 with tempo and hitting that bishop again. And now if the bishop moves, now we take on c6 takes, and we just simply take a free pawn, and this is a decisive advantage white. White's doing very, very well here. So that's kind of why people don't just recapture this pawn with knight takes d5. That's why people need to play this move pawn to a6 and counterattack. It looks kind of goofy, but this is the move we got to play. So here we have b takes c6, uh, bishop takes c6, which is what happened in the Anand versus Aronian game. We have bc6, and then we have this move knight to e4, knight takes e4, d takes e4, c takes d5, queen d5, queen d5, e d5. Okay, so we, we get to this position, and uh, it's you've got a four on three, on this side of the board, and you've got a four on two on this side of the board. I would think this position should be some sort of uh, slight edge for white, but of course, black still has an immediate resource. He has e5, knight d2, e3, which is what got played. We have fe3, bishop e3, king h1, and then we have bishop g4, and these two bishops are very, very active, and it does yield uh, some compensation uh, kind of for what's going on. And uh, that compensation was enough for Aronian to end up getting the draw. Uh, after knight f3, bishop takes c1, rook takes c1, we had rook e2. This rook is very active on the seventh rank. It's not so easy to kick it off. Uh, and we're going to end up in a four rook end game pretty quickly. So it continued b4, bishop f3, rook f3, rook takes a2. And we have a four rook end game. And yeah, white might be a little bit better here, but black just got his pawn back. And it's not so clear that we can get anything out of this at all. And of course, in just a few more moves, the game did end in a draw. It ended on move 31 with uh, the, you know, the players shaking hands and everybody going home. Okay, so going back, uh, 
that's kind of what happens with this early d5. That's kind of the main line is d5, knight on b to d2 is sort of the main line. So what happens if they play slow? Because a lot of people do want to play slow in these positions. They just want to castle and then play something like rook e8 and d5. And in a lot of ways, this is more natural because it feels like we shouldn't play d5 until we break the pin. Uh, that's just our natural instincts as players. Like, why are we playing d5 and self-pinning? It seems weird. It seems dangerous. It seems scary. It seems odd. So after castles kingside, white typically just castles kingside himself, and then we have this slow move, d6, and now we have uh, this slow move from white, just h3, preventing bishop g4, getting ready to play d4, kind of in the traditional uh, Roy Lopez type of plan. So here we have a couple different moves. We have a6 hitting this bishop, uh, and we have knight e7. So knight e7 follows uh, a really heavy game. Knight e7 follows uh, Carlson versus Kramnik, uh, played back in 2015. Uh, that game continued with d4, bishop back to b6, bishop d3, uh, pawn to d5 striking it in the middle, uh, and then we have knight on b to d2, d takes e4, knight takes e4, knight takes e4, bishop takes e4, uh, takes queen c2, gaining a tempo, forcing the weakening of the light squares, h6, a4, c6, rook to d1, knight to d5, uh, knight takes d4, uh, rook e8, a5, and this game is super complex. Like, even after all these moves, the computer was still just kind of declaring that this position was somewhere close to equal. Uh, but of course, uh, Magnus Carlsen did manage to win this game with the white pieces eventually. Uh, after bishop takes a5, uh, he just played his knight back to f3, pawn to b5, knight came back to d4, hitting c6, and after uh, bishop back to c7, we had knight here, uh, queen, queen here, pawn to g3, bishop to b7, and I mean, within these complexities, somehow white's coming out on top, and I mean, that's just the impressiveness of Magnus Carlsen, uh, just playing uh, the opening so smoothly and almost Karpovian-like, you know, bringing the knight back to c3, bringing it back to d4, eventually taking on c6, and of course here, you know, you don't have queen takes c6 because bishop d5, and you know, everything else. And uh, of course, bishop d5 followed by bishop f4 is also on the table, and all this stuff happened. You know, bishop b7, uh, we have bishop to f4 right away, uh, queen takes c6, bishop takes d5, uh, rook e1 check, uh, king h2, and already at this point, after rook e1 check, king h2, this position is already just decisive advantage uh, white, and uh, black uh, felt obligated to sacrifice his queen to try to save the game, but it wasn't enough, and of course, after this, uh, Magnus Carlsen played just kind of perfectly after rook d1, etc. Uh, he just kind of played perfect chess with perfect technique, uh, which is what he's known for, and he beat Vladimir Kramnik uh, back in, you know, 2015 in this line. So that's uh, one option, is after h3 we can have this move uh, a knight, uh, we can have this move knight e7, as this is kind of what Kramnik tried. And of course, you know, in my chess experience, this is also the move I tend to be more scared of, you know, because, you know, it threatens stuff like c6 and d5. Uh, but you know, we just follow exactly what Carlson did. Uh, we just play for this early d4, you know, and then after bishop b6, we just, uh, you know, keep the center of the board and we just handle the central tension in the absolute correct way. We just defend our middle and everything should be okay. So the other move instead of knight e7 is, of course, a6, putting the question to the bishop. And here we should just play sort of a, another delayed kind of exchange. We should just play bishop takes c6, bc6, and then rook e1, and we're just preparing uh, the move point to d4. So this delayed exchange is a little bit different uh, than the uh, other delayed exchange I was talking about, because black didn't really have the option to take back with his d-pawn. He only had the option to take back with his b-pawn. And what's kind of interesting is, you know, I was always taught this rule when I was a kid, you know, always take towards the middle. And what's really funny is in most of the openings that I play with white, like in the Roy Lopez or like any type of delayed exchange on c6, it's almost always, always better to take back away from the middle of the board. And what that has to do with is it helps black control the d4 square because he has an open file directly on d4, which prevents white from playing, uh, you know, d3 to d4 easily. Because if you have a queen controlling that square, it prevents that. And then another thing is the bishop pair seems to function better if this pawn is over here. Like the bishop pair seems to have kind of a little bit more mobility. And it seems like that bishop pair functions better. Not necessarily on b6, but let's say b7. So I still like having some retreat for my bishop on c5. But you kind of get the idea. It's a little bit better to take away from the center 
in almost all these positions. I was always taught that it was to speed up your development, but of course that's not the only reason, and it's not really even the real reason. Uh, the, the real reason we take away from the center in so many of these positions is basically just to keep an eye on the d4 square and prevent white from naturally playing the move uh, pawn to d4 in a way that's easy. So whenever you can play sort of a delayed exchange where they have to uh, recapture with this pawn, it's usually not a bad idea to do it because it means that you're not going to have any difficulty getting in d4 and when you do get in d4 it's not going to have any impact on these doubled pawns. These doubled pawns are still going to be there, they're going to be weaknesses and they're going to be in the position. As a matter of fact it creates an additional difficulty because if you play d4 and they capture and you capture back you have a pawn duo in the middle of the board which is something that people don't typically want to allow. And if they leave that pawn duo there, you're going to take on e5, they're going to take on e5, and then these pawns aren't just doubled, they're doubled and isolated. So that's kind of the idea of what's going on here, you know, very long-winded explanation. So anyway, so uh, the game we're following here is Carlson versus Grischuk, played in London back in 2013. That game continued rookie eight. Uh, we have knight up to d2. d5, you know, striking in the middle himself, trying to take advantage of the fact that he took towards the center. So this actually makes total logical sense. He wants to strike in the middle before white does. And then we have ed5, queen d5, knight b3, bishop back to f8, uh, pawn to c4, queen goes back to d6, bishop to e3, all very natural looking moves, knight to d7, and then of course pawn to d4. Uh, Carlson wouldn't really have done any of this uh, if he thought black would be able to lock everything down with a move like c5, which is why black played his last couple of moves. He's trying to lock it all down with c5 and prevent white from playing pawn to d4. Once white gets in pawn to d4, everything's perfectly fine. It's just white structure versus black structure, essentially. And of course, black is going to end up with these permanent weaknesses here and here, and white isn't. So after e4 and then knight d2, White's position is perfectly acceptable here. This position is just slight edge white. Black has the weaknesses and white doesn't. So therefore white should just be a little bit better. And of course, uh, you know, Magnus Carlsen playing the white pieces, uh, he did uh, go on to win from, from this position. So that's basically the overview of how to play the anti-Berlin uh, when you are choosing to just play this very slow uh, sort of d3 and then not capture on c6 right away. So after bishop c5, you're choosing to play sort of the traditional slow plan of playing c3 and d4, and you're not going to capture on c6 right away. In fact, you're going to wait at least until they play d6 and pop probably till you get prompted with a move like a6 before you would capture on c6 to try to execute your d4 maneuver. Okay, so I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.